knowing that Homo sapiens, our species, is the only species that makes art and starts to do it really in a large, I mean, really vigorously from you know, 40,000 years ago, I thought I have to understand what it is about our biology, that our special biology would, might make us to make it. And I thought it must have the, the neuroscience, the brain, the nervous system must be the area which is most important to understand. The main purpose of the book is to, you know, to test the hypothesis that a knowledge of neuroscience, particularly the latest neuroscience, can enhance our understanding of art and, and can enable us to answer questions that haven't been answered previously. When I came to the OEA in 1971, I expected to spend my career teaching what I did my PhD on, which is Italian Renaissance architecture. And, uh, and I might have done that if Bob and Lisa Sainsbury hadn't given the university their art collection and given the Sainsbury Center. When Norman Foster came and, and talked to the department and uh, said he'd got this commission to design this building and said he had no idea what the building would look like, he had no idea how the objects would be displayed. Um, we realized that this was not going to be a predictable experience. Every time I went for a cup of coffee, I walked through a gallery containing works of art from all over the world going back to, from to prehistory and, and coming up to the present. These were works of art by large that I, I knew nothing about. I was uh, captivated by objects which might otherwise have seemed like just routine, you know, another Japanese figurine or another Egyptian hippopotamus. I had to think about them. I had to ask the type of questions I was used to asking about classical art. I started off with the classicist and then Italian Renaissance art. Uh, you know, why did this person make that, uh, the person who was living at that time in that place? And the more I looked, the more I, I thought, well, the answers that you find in the books of art history uh, or anthropology textbooks or the archaeology textbooks, the people who've written about these, I, I don't find satisfying. I was then having discussions with a friend uh, about the origins of art. He was an archaeologist and we were looking at these earliest cave paintings and trying to develop a, an explanation for how they came into being. And then in 1976, I think it was, I heard the Reith lectures on the brain. I said, there's, 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 there's something here that I can use. I only really concentrated on neuroscience when we changed the name of the school from art history to world art studies. And I said, we should do something that nobody's doing, that we should ask the big questions. Why do humans make art? And why do they make it differently in different places at different times? It was just a pure chance that that is literally the moment, 1992, 1993, 1994, this is the moment when discovery after discovery was made. So I started just systematically reading everything that I could about the brain. And slowly, I acquired sort of what I felt was an integrated understanding of the brain. One of the most important discoveries of neuroscience is that the brain is constantly being reshaped by every experience that one has. In each case, what we're seeing is the way our neural resources, the unique neural resources of Homo sapiens, how these are constantly being engaged by changing environments. And it's that which is the critical thing, the intensity of people's engagement with their environment. It's that passionate engagement which I think is much more likely to lead to the emergence of a strong work of art. I would like to think 
that, uh, in a sense, that the book is answering the puzzle that's posed by the Sainsbury Centre. Why does this object made in this place at that time look like this? The book says, well, in fact, if you go back and reconstruct what life was like in the environment where this was made at the time when it was made, you can reconstruct their neural formation or salient aspects of their neural formation, which enable you to say, that's why you know, that person at this time in this place made that object. You can't do that unless you think of a, a particular person at a particular place at a particular time and pull that into sharp focus, because the sharper you can focus your picture of that person, the clearer you can be about their visual neural resources and the movement of their hands, which are guided by those visual neural resources.